In part five of our six-part series of conversations with Dr. Glenn Alba, we go back to Golf Smarter number 559, originally published on September 27, 2016, for an episode we call The Truth About Playing Better Golf by Using Your Imagination. Dr. Alba was a regular guest on Golf Smarter because of his books and for being a pioneering sports psychologist who spent decades enhancing the life of and games of golfers of all skill levels. Dr. Alba passed away in early 2023 at the age of 91, and he was such an incredibly influential guest on Golf Smarter. I wanted to make sure that beyond his two books, that we pay our respects to this coaching legend. This conversation was recorded on video and is available on our Golf Smarter TV channel. Links to the video, his two books, and where to make donations in his memory are in today's show notes. Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. It doesn't take long to lock into a target. The target doesn't move. Because some people see shapes and they see it coming and landing. What we have to discover, Fred, is how you see best. Because it's not the same for everybody. I can't tell you what you should see, but you're going to tell me what you see when you trust your swing. The players that play at the highest level have wonderful imaginations. So is the guy say eight handicap. We want to find out what you see best. And then we can lock in that particular visual image. It's the same with feeling a swing that matches it. Some people feel a fluid, fluid, fluid motion. But whatever it is, it's a whole movement of the swing. It's much like creative writers. They see things in paragraphs. They don't write sentences. So when we're playing our best, we're playing in paragraphs. Whatever we feel in our swing, it's, it's the whole motion. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Glenn. Great to be back, Fred. It's great to see you again. I'm glad to see you're, you're doing well. you got a huge smile on your face. It's, it's wonderful. You know what? I was looking back, and this is, uh, I think, like the fourth or fifth time you've been on the podcast. And what's really strange is the first episode that you were on um, is exactly 10 years ago today that we're recording this. Oh, my. Uh, yep. <laughs> September 26, 2006 was when we were first introduced to Winning the Battle Within. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, it's a long relationship we've been having, my friend. <laughs> yes, yes. But well, we're still um, we're working. We're still working on winning the battle within. Well, yeah, of course, we, still... have, we have to find out what the battle is, and then, of course, we can win it. Yeah. Oh, you didn't tell me that. Wait a minute. You've got a secret to this that you didn't share with me in the first four times we did this. You got to identify the battle. Well, one of them we'll talk about today is. How do I learn to play with my imagination? That's one of the battles. Yeah. And when we learn to do it, we're towards winning winning the battle. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think playing with your imagination is such a um, fun topic to cover um, because, y you, you know, if you're just going out there and worrying about your swing and not worrying about the target and not, you know, just focus on the contact, then you're missing out on a whole lot of golf. I certainly agree with that. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's amazing to me how much um, imagination and creativity is required in a single round of golf, especially for those shots that you don't practice. So, so it's beyond imagination and creativity. It's just, well, I saw it on TV. I must be able to do this. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, as we say, be able to play in your imagination – you must understand, you know, your athletic mind. And we have to understand, you know, we do have three minds in which we uh, train with and which we perform with. And we understand that. And then we can make that's the next step toward being able to play in the athletic mind, which means to play with your imagination, where we see and feel and hear. And we play in our senses. 
that's part of a mind that works a thousand times faster than our thinking brain. And so we have to get there. Of course, we do know what it is, and we knew what we have to know more about how we get there and just stay there consistently. The consistently is, I think, is the struggle. <laughs> well, because you're always second guessing yourself on the golf course, aren't you? I mean, are, aren't most amateurs doing that? I don't know about the pros, but I would think that amateurs are second guessing themselves nonstop on what they just did, what they're about to do, what they're thinking about doing. Well, our our golf industry promotes that. It promotes it. Uh, in a couple of workshops that we've done, we call it the coach of the future. The coach of the future is going to be much more than a fixed coach. Mm -hmm. He's going to be a protagonist for self-discovery and for self-coaching. In order to do that, he's going to have to coach in a different way. Now, that doesn't ever undervalue the importance of fixing things, but if you really want to play at the highest level possible that it will allow that your your skills allow you, you've got to go beyond that. And the coach of the future has to be a, a person who can lead you and give you those opportunities so you can play with the flourish and un unleash your imagination. You know, we think of coach, we think of um people that you've worked with like Pete Carroll of right uh, in he's football a, and you think a, about, and Bill Walsh great, yes yeah great coaches great, great coaches coach. but yeah. it, it it's as motivators and strategists which is very different than you have in golf as when you have to coach yourself well the, one of the things that we want to have our coaches learn to do, and certainly Pete Carroll personifies that, is to call self-coaching. So we can provide an environment where a person can learn more about, for example, wouldn't it be great, Fred, that you can walk them into practice see the first tee with a swing you can trust? Yes. Well, okay, I can help yes. you with that. Wouldn't okay. it be great? Wouldn't it be great if you had a procedure that you used we call a pre-shot routine that we give you the best chance to hit the best shot possible. Wouldn't that be great? That would be awesome. Wouldn't it be great that you had a procedure that would uh, allow you to bounce back from difficult situations where you miss shots? Wouldn't that be great? That would be great. Wouldn't it be great also that you had a, a, some skills that allow you to enjoy the bad times in between? As our Marin County friend, Michael Murphy, tells us in Golf in the Kingdom, if you can enjoy the times in between in golf, you can enjoy the times in between in life. Well, 90% of the time we're in between in golf, aren't we? Yeah. So if self-coaching leads us, I've got to be able to do something in between that will give me the best chance to be ready for the next shot. Self-coaching. Self-coaching. Self-coaching without being one of those coaches that just is berating you the entire time, which is living in my head right now. Oh, yeah. It's a, it gets way too much. Yeah, we don't want the, Mike, the, Mike, the kind of Mike Ditka kind of coach who's yelling and screaming or Bobby Knight type of character. That, that's well, who's living in my head right now when I, get, when I step on the putting green. Yeah, those are... The, 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 in golf, uh, our golf coaches don't necessarily berate us, but they fill it oftentimes with so much information, it's very difficult for us to play automatically, mm -hmm. which means to play in, our, uh, play in our athletic mind. You know, if we, have, if we look at it this way, Fred, we have three minds. One is the athletic mind, which we are allowed to unleash our imagination. See, feel, hear, shots. We have another, which is our thinking mind. They can only do one thing at a time. And it's certainly the last thing it doesn't, doesn't play any golf. It can allow us, we can help us learn, learn new skills. But it overpowers us if we think about things if, when we're trying to swing. 
uh, the swing takes less than two seconds. Why in the world should I be thinking about anything other than seeing a targets and feeling swings? Why in the world? So oftentimes our golf teachers and well-intentioned give us a lot of information, which is what would be up to us to process so we can eventually make so that our swing could be automatic. But if we're still thinking about the information our golf teacher has given us, it's really difficult to have that fluid motion swing, which, of course, we see. We saw all weekend, didn't we? We see the great players at Eastlake. And, of course, I watched very carefully, you know, the, the, on Victoria Island, uh, rooting for Scott McCarron, who's my guy for so long. He had a chance to win that. But those swings are fluid and beautiful. And that didn't happen overnight. You know, they went through a process of learning how to play with see, feel, and trust their swings. Of course, we, we coach in a different way if we want to, to, to uh, help people understand this whole internal feedback mechanism. Uh, you know, I, I'm listening to and I'm thinking about the round that I had just this past weekend. And I was getting to a point where I was um, losing too many balls off the tee. Everything else was going okay except for the, the putting part. But And so I started. And then, of course, I became a second swing All-American, right? I would lose a ball in the first swing and go up there and say, just slow everything down, relax, and I'd have a great drive. So then I started going up to the tee box going, okay, I've already lost one ball in my mind. I'd say to myself, I've already lost one ball. Just make this your second swing. And I'd have a nice drive off the tee. Help. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if, if, we expect, if, we, if I expect a person to be able to play in their imagination, then I have to set up training so they learn more about their imagination and internal internal feedback mechanism. For example, uh, Friday, I work with the uh, University of Civic Golf Team. I'm still hang out at the university, of course. Mm -hmm. And John Crook, the coach, has enlisted my aid. So what we're going to do today with the players is to help them get in touch with their internal feedback mechanism. So we did a lot of, uh, quite a few drills, but here's a couple of them. Okay, Fred, what I'd like you to do this time is I want you to step up. Uh, I want you to have a target. I want you to have an image of the target. Now, people see different things. Some people see the whole shape of a shot. Some people see just the start of the trajectory. Some people see it land. Some people just see the target. But what I want you to do is pick up the visual image, walk into your dress position, swing, and see how long you're able to keep that image while you're swinging. Mm. All right, that's all. So you swing, no judgment, just tell me. So you swing and you turn back and, uh, oh, I was able to keep the image of the target the whole way through. Wow. All right. Uh, next time. Uh, I watched the shot. It went high right. The person, uh, how'd you do that time with the image? I lost the image right right about before I was coming to impact. Where did your, where did your concentration go then? Well, I was wanting to make sure that my swing was coming down in the right plane. Wow. Maybe, maybe if you'd have kept the image, let's try it again and keep the image and see if that helps you, you know, trust your swing. So... Would they get to do this a number of different times, and what they do, they get to practice, you know, keeping an image and finding out what the image, the visual image, is, is most effective for them. Uh, and it's no judgment on the shot, just well, how well they kept this image, because that's that's part of this internal feedback system, the visual. But then we will take. Uh, okay, now we're going to work on kinesthetic the fluidness and tension-free of the swing. So I want you to swing this time, Fred. And I want you to swing. And if it's, it's free of tension, that would be a 10. 
Mm-hmm. And you turn around and tell me. If it's a one, that means you probably held on to it for, you know, for dear life. <laughs> so you swing, you turn around and tell me, but more importantly, you're telling yourself, wow, that was about a seven. I felt a little bit of tension right about that impact. Okay. So we're working on two. One, we have what? Visual. Now we're on kinesthetic. And so the next drill that we'll do, I'll stop for a second, take a breath. You might have a question. You. No, 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 no. I, I don't know. <laughs> Please keep going. I have many questions, but I, I'm, I don't want to break your train. Go. Well, okay, that's two. Now we get to, uh, now what I'd like you to do, I want you to change club. Take your eight iron now. And uh, I want you to close your eyes at impact. Um. Oh, about 10 years ago, Scott McCarran and his caddy, in fact, he has the same caddy now, we used to close our eyes all the way through. They'd say, we're going to close our eyes at impact. And when you close your eyes at impact, anybody that's listening to this, you can try this. You have about 50% more recognition of what happens at impact. It's amazing what happens. Really? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. And... And so all you do is tell me this time and yourself, what did it feel like an impact? If you had a real free release, that's a 10. Mm -hmm. If you held on and it shanked it, that's a two. So you just swing and you tell me what you felt. Now, you can see how this leads to self-coaching. Because now I've learned to really recognize the feel of impact. And And also there's a sound, of course. I've got those two. Others, I have the, the auditory and the tactile, which is the touch. So I'm playing, and I hit a ball high right, and I say to myself, I'm aware now, huh, I held on. Well, I don't have to fix my swing. I have to fix the way I execute. Okay, come on, Glenn. Come on, Fred. Let's let this one go next time. So, but in do our training process of inner game training, we have to go through these drills. You know, we have, you know, eight or nine of them to help people develop awareness of their internal feedback system. Because that's the that's the system in which we play. Right. We don't yeah. So that's what I would have you do. Now, as you develop this awareness of your internal feedback system, you place this into your pre shot routine. You might find out that boy, I'm really visual. So I'm back behind the ball. I really have to connect to my target. And I really have to see. In fact, I see the whole shot. So that's going to be a really important part of my pre-shot routine. So I keep that image. I go into my dress position and I keep that image. Now, another person is also visual, but they really like to feel that fluid motion. So when they step in, not only they're seeing the target, they're feeling the swing in advance. Mm. Anyway, so that moves us, you know, the self-discovery of developing awareness of an internal feedback system to put into our pre-shot routine. But now you can also see how this, you were going to say something, go ahead. All part of the pre-shot routine we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, I was going to, I don't want to advance the conversation beyond where you are because I'm sure that there's a post shot routine as well. That's the next step. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Uh, or continue <clears throat> where, where you were. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, the post shot routine is, uh, is the awareness of, uh, is, let's say that I really release a great trusting swing, hit a nice, beautiful, soft draw into a, back left pin. I love it. It's in my memory. Uh, and I, it's right there. It's never going to go away. I can really feel that shot. Let's say that I was stepping up to hit a soft draw to that back left pin. And wow. Uh, it went high right. So my awareness and my post draw routine is, hmm, well, you lost the image of the target. And you start thinking about your swing. Mm-hmm. So what I need to do immediately is recognize that. Don't judge it. Just describe it. 
And if I'm out there in the fairway with my seven iron, take the swing you wanted with that nice fluid motion. And now I've refocused. We call it reviewing, replacing, refocusing. Now I'm ready for the next shot. And you better do it quickly. Yeah. You know, so that you're ready for the next shot. Sure. Sure. But that you have time to, for the next shot, obviously you have time to think about it. And, and, well, maybe not to think about it, maybe to be aware so I can. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because in, a, in our limited system, the one we're talking about, it works so fast. It's what we watch athletes or anybody, performers, dancers, uh, singers, or watch anybody that performs beautifully. Well, they're, they're in that system that works at least a thousand times faster. At right. least. Yeah. yeah. And so if indeed that's what we want to do, be when we play, a certain portion of our training needs to, to for us to train and enhance, you know, our internal feedback system. That's our imagination. So we can play with our athletic mind. So often for me, what, what might happen is that I'll, I'll do target golf. I'll pick it. I'll stand behind the ball. I'll look at the three points down the line from the ball to the final, final resting place, final target. Um, and then I'll focus on something as small as I can in the distance, which is the line that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And I, and I really try to fine tune that, that target. You know, I'm not just looking at the mountaintop. I'm looking at the patch of brown inside the patch of green on that mountaintop. I try to focus. But then I'll step up to the ball, and all of a sudden, I'll, I'll, I'll see, all I see is the ball. I'll turn my head. I'll take another peek out to the distance to see that target. But I, don't, I honestly can't tell you how long I can keep that image in my head before I start focusing on club head position, ball position, feet position, Back swing, uh, you so, know, on and on. Uh, well, all of that's got to be, uh, you have to, it has to be automatic. You can't <laughs> be thinking about any of that stuff. Look, it doesn't take long to lock into a target. The target doesn't move. The, t the target doesn't necessarily have to be a finite target, a specific one, because some people see shapes. They just see a big wide shape and you see it coming in and landing what we have to discover fred is how you see best which is the most effective way for you because it's not the same for everybody i can't tell you what you should see but you're going to tell me what you see when you when you when you trust your swing what do i see and this can happen at all levels you know this is obviously the the players that play at the highest level have you know uh, wonderful imaginations, and they see they're quite astute visually. But so is a guy say eight handicap. He sees things too. But we we want to find out what you see best, and then we can lock in that particular visual image for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with it's the same with feeling a swing that matches it. What do you feel? Some people feel a fluid, fluid, fluid motion, beautiful fluid motion. And some people feel it's a, a little shorter. But whatever it is, it's a whole, the whole movement of the swing. It's much like creative writers. You're a creative journalist. They see things in, they see things in paragraphs. They don't write sentences. They write paragraphs. So when we're playing our best, we're playing in paragraphs. So whatever we feel in our swing, whatever we feel in our swing, it's it's the whole motion. Oh, I need oh. to write that one down. We when we play our best, we see things in paragraphs. I love that. Yeah. Oh man, that's beautiful. Um, so the, how about the the jazz? You know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of you know, I'm a, a music fan. Sure. And I love I love I love jazz. And the improvisation of jazz. Yeah. yeah. And Stan Getz, the great tenor sax player. Uh, I met him. Uh, his his uh, 
I guess the person that lived with him was Bill Walsh's secretary for five oh, years. Oh, really? And Stan Getz came and was a visiting professor at Stanford for one year. Yeah. And, and why did he leave? He left because there was nobody to play with. And when we talked to Stan Getz, he's a great technician, great technician, as great golfers are. But when he plays, he's in this wonderful mind of imagination. And that's how they improvise. They don't know where is that, are they going, but they do know. Yeah, but of course, that that is after years of technical training. I mean, I don't think that somebody who um, has never had, let me just say, art lessons or just experience with art can can paint an abstract that would be appreciated by many others, where it takes someone who has... How am I trying to express this? Um, hmm. I, are you seeing where I'm going with this? Is, is that it, you, yes. you, can't, you can't do jazz. You can't do improvisation until you know. You can't work out of the box until you understand the box. Oh, no, absolutely. Sense? I yeah. said Stan Gett was a great technician. Right. Great technician. And uh, obviously in golf, look, don't ever misunderstand me. Anybody's listening to this. Technique's important. Okay. And, and they have the right stuff. Te- technology is amazing, but it's only the price of admission to high level play. <laughs> and we have to go beyond it. But don't misunderstand me. It's important. It's important to to have a grip that works. It's important to understand some of the technique of. Uh, I mean, look at I. I know many, many really, really good golf teachers. Many good. Oh, and know. the ones that I value the highest are the ones that can go beyond. And go beyond can also, you know, help people unleash their imagination. But but obviously, technique is essential. Yeah. But look at, Fred, our golf industry bombards us with technology and ways to fix us. And Arnold Palmer is one of the first to say that the old technology has overwhelmed us. It's overwhelmed us. This golf swing is really pretty simple. Why are we making it so damn complicated? Now, and we do. And we have a great time because that's the stream of cash. That's where the golf the golf industry makes money by selling you equipment and fixing your swing. Do they make any money by teaching you to use your imagination? I don't know. But I know Probably that's not. a step. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, do they make any money uh, having you use old clubs and old technology? No, they want you to keep changing. Oh, it's amazing. It's a uh, look at I can hit a ball. I can hit five shots on a track, man. I can find what I can. I find out all kinds of things, right? Right. All, every everything, yeah. all this stuff. Probably my middle name as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned Arnold Palmer a moment ago, and as we're recording this, he passed away just yesterday. And it's almost impossible to get into a conversation about golf this week without remembering Arnold and the impact that he had on the game. And he must have been uh, coming along and and really making his mark when you were a young golfer as well. Um, Oh, yeah. do you, can you share any stories about the influence that he had on you and your game and and your philosophies on teaching? Well, I think if uh, he is right, well, right dead center, you know that. If you read all the, I mean, there's there's all kinds of information about him now, all these quotes and et cetera. But he was he was always. Uh, always saying that we're making this way too complicated. Look at the guy had charisma. He was sexy as hell. He really could play the game. He was so, he played with um, courage, you know, with passion. And uh, he was just so much fun to watch. I mean, he was, uh, he went for it. Uh, and he was kind of unorthodox, wasn't he? Kind of. Yeah. Kind of unorthodox, yeah. like some other players are. But, man, he could really, I mean, he made contact. He was, uh, 
he's a wonderful, just a wonderful, wonderful human being. I remember one scene when he was playing in the uh, AT&T a long time ago, and I was following John Flannery, who was one of my first players. This is sometime in the early 90s. Okay. And I was standing in the trees, and he, he was walking by. He was standing, I was standing in the trees, and he looked over at me. He looked right in my eye, then gave me a wink and a thumbs up. So he did that so often. I mean, that's a, that's a true story. That's wow. the way he was. And but he didn't, has, you had never met him before. No, he didn't know no, you. No. But he that's just made he contact. Oh, yeah. As, uh, Even the slightest contact, and you feel touched. Well, he, he made everybody feel special right. when you're with him. That's what great teachers do, great coaches. Right. When you're with them, you know you are the most important person that I'm working with at the moment. And Arnold was uh, beautiful in that way. So we live in a very different time than when Arnie came of age. Um, where, you know, we would, we would hear about Arnie and he built Arnie's army based on newspaper reports and possibly, uh, television recaps because you weren't, you know, right now we live in a, obviously the 24 hour news cycle, which is with the internet's turned into a 24 second news cycle. Things change so rapidly and so fast. What was it about Arnie that, that you remember at that time that, just had his charisma, had his magnetism jump through the pages of the newspaper and jump through the, the radio reports and the newspaper and the television reports. Well, yes. Uh, did I, did I already, did I mention that before? Yes. He is the, as you said, he's a charismatic, um, great sex appeal, um, courageous, you know, uh, Love competition uh, was so acknowledged. Uh, the the, um, the other people he competed with, I think he he loved he loved the action. And I, I'm not sure it was always all about the winning. I think he just embraced the opportunity, you know, to to be a closer, mm -hmm. to to be in to be there. Because I mean, he had some heartbreaks, though. And of course, he has some great, great triumphs. But anybody that lays it on the line, like Arnold Palmer, or the great teams that we watch, or the coaches, or the athletes, the ones that truly, truly are blessed with the opportunity to know that they embrace the opportunity to compete with the best. And they love that. And they love that more. And I think they love that more than the winning. Hmm. And Did I think that he, he clearly, to me, personified that. Right, right. Do you remember the time where he just, he was at his best and, and that even with his losses, I think that he was so endearing that people would feel his pain and, and, and feel like they lost as well. Um, have you witnessed any other athletes uh, in your time since that compare to what Arnie's Army was like? Oh, Oh, teams or athletes? Yeah. Either or. Uh, I mean, could be the think, Celtics of the 50s or, or Tiger Woods or Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali. I mean, there's so many different. How about the. Uh, Arthur Ashe. How about the, uh, how about the Seahawks? We're in the two-yard line oh. and they throw the interception. And so Pete Carroll is a good friend, of course. Yes. So let's. Talk about that and how he responded. So, two days after that, uh, Martin Lahr from Today's Show was interviewing. It's a great interview. Matt Lauer, yeah. Uh, yes, it's a great interview. And he started the interview by saying, Pete, I want you to know, when you made that call, I thought it was the worst call in the history of football. So Pete Carroll said, eh, not the worst call, maybe the worst result. Mm -hmm. He said, what did you do in that, at that, at that moment? He said, I had about 15 seconds. 
and said the next thing I had to do to make sure that we put this in perspective, and it took some time to do that. But the whole the thing about it is, if he, if if they're going to be judged on one play, well, let me retract. Let me go back because you asked me an important question. I would say that that the Pete Carrolls and the Arnold Palmers and other athletes they say it's not. It's not about whether we won it or lost it. It was about being having the opportunity, embrace the opportunity to be there, and to be there and make the play and give herself the chance. It's not whether the play worked. It's having the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Look, at, they talk about closers. The closer is that guy that comes in and the Giants are looking for one, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. <laughs> All the in- the only interviews we do, and I've written about it, the closers are not always the best players. But the closers are the ones that want the ball. They want to have the opportunity. And it's not about winning it. It's having the opportunity. Hmm. So Arnold Arnold personified that. He wanted the opportunity to be in the action, always. And he responded you know, beautifully. And it wasn't always the green jacket. But he was always had the green jacket personality because he always he just absolutely embraced that opportunity. Mm. Thanks for giving me a chance to say that. Oh, yeah. my! Thank you so much for saying that. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Let's uh, let everybody know about the book too. Uh, Winning the battle within. How about a, a brief summary for those who've not heard about it? Oh, uh, winning the battle within is uh, was a life's work, and uh, it chronicles. You know, the whole process that we may need to go through in order for us to give ourselves the best chance. The last chapter is getting to the winner's circle. And the first chapter is the introduction is what all the steps that we need to take to give ourselves the best chance. It's never a guarantee. It's just I can guarantee you if you follow these principles, you will give yourself the best chance. And that's the critical element. Give yourself a chance to be there. Yeah. Right. No, I, I, growing up, I always used to say, I don't necessarily want a Cadillac. I just want to be able to afford the option. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Got so any other books coming uh, down the uh, pipeline? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm collaborating with Eric Jones, you know, the long drive champion. He may have been on one of your broadcasts. I don't know. He's, he's an exceptional guy. And we're about 80% done. Uh, Actually, I hope he's listening, because it balls in his court at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, I'll fun. reach out to him, and we'll get him on the show. We'll definitely do that. Oh, he's he's good. He's good. He's uh, you know, he won the long drive uh, Bastion championship uh-huh. in two thousand and four. Then he repeated in two thousand and twelve. In fact, I have a great podcast of my interview with him, you know, what did he do, you know, in order to give himself the best chance. Now, he hits it really far, and he's not a big guy. And now, of course, he's a teacher of golf, and he's really explored and taken the whole thing about sports psychology and teaching technique and bringing them both together. The name of the book is Trust Your Swim. Mm. Yeah. And when can we hopefully see it? Eric, are you paying attention? We're balls in your court. When do we get to see this book? Oh, yeah. You know, I think uh, for sure by February. Okay. Of 2017. That's about 80% done. Okay. So then in uh, February 2017, you better expect to hear back from me to get you back on the show. Oh, I'd I'd love that. That would be great. This is so uh, good. Anytime I have an opportunity to talk about this, you know, I'm absolutely uh, delighted. And I appreciate you giving me the invitation. You know, you've done, uh, you've been doing this for 10 years? Yeah. Well, it's uh, morphed into quite a deal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> podcasting has morphed into quite a deal because when, the, when I first contacted you in 2006 and said podcast, I'm sure you said, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? What's a podcast? I so, yeah, I, I've definitely watched this thing grow, and uh, podcasting has taken 
taken front seat to many other uh, forms of, uh, of uh, media. It's, it's awesome. I love it. It is amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, so remember, remember, though, that technology is only the price of admission to the various high-level play. It doesn't matter what the endeavor is. Right. And the stuff that you do, because you're beautifully spontaneous, <laughs> by the way. Thank you. And that, that takes practice. <laughs> well, yeah, oh, it definitely does. And I'm going to repeat that and ask, probably call you when my wife says, can you just stay focused on one thing? No, but Glenn said I'm beautifully spontaneous. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. You're welcome, Fred. <laughs> uh, Glenn, it's always great to talk to you. I thank you so much for your time. It's great to see you this time. Yeah, you, this, I think the first time we've done this through video. Um, but, I know. Yeah. But thank it's You look great. And um, I wish you all the best and can't wait for the next book to come out. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred.